Um, welcome to this session uh, of the uh, EP inquiry. We're, we're um, gradually approaching uh, the end of the, uh, of the inquiry, but we still have a few interesting sessions uh, ahead of us. Um, before I, uh, I introduce this afternoon's program, I would like to uh, say hello and welcome to the visitors group of Mrs. Morvai, uh, all women, something, uh, <laughs> hello everybody, <laughs> very good, very good. Um, so colleagues, uh, today the presentation of the oversight mechanisms of the German Bundestag has been postponed to a later meeting uh, as they're all very busy um, in uh, building a new coalition government. Um, and the presentation of the working document uh, by Mr. Moraes and Mr. Kirkhope on the scope of international European and national security in the EU perspective uh, has also been postponed to a further meeting, but still before the Christmas break, I believe, yes. Um, so if you all agree, then uh, we will adopt the agenda with these modifications, no objections. Um, then today we have two sessions, uh, one session uh, in the series Oversight of Intelligence Services at National Level in an Era of Mass Surveillance. We will listen to a statement by our guest, Mr. Uh, Michael Tetchner, member of the Standing Committee on Scrutiny and Constitutional Affairs of the Stortinget in Norway, which is the Norwegian Parliament. And the second session from four o'clock onwards will be dedicated to the presentation of the working document on uh, U.S. surveillance activities with respect to EU data and its possible legal implications on the existing transatlantic agreements and cooperation, uh, co-authored by our rapporteur, Mr. Claude Moraes, and the shadow, Mr. Voss. Um, and then we aim to end the meeting at five o'clock. Um, I see that we are not very numerous in terms of MEPs present, uh, but I would still like to ask you when we get to uh, the questions and answers to be uh, concise, and I promise you if we have enough time, and I think we will, that you can come back for a second round if you feel the need. So um, it is a pleasure for me to, uh, to welcome Mr. Uh, Michael Tetchner. I'm going to give you the floor for... Uh, a short presentation on the oversight mechanisms in Norway, and then we'll open the floor for questions and answers. You have the floor. Thank you, yes. Thank you very much for your in, in, uh, introduction, Madam. Uh, Norway is uh, not yet an, an official language of EU, but some one of us are working for Norway to join someday. In the meantime, I will prefer to use my Danish mother tongue in this presentation. Um, so with, uh, if the interpreters are ready, I am ready. Um, Firstly, I would like to thank for the very nice invitation we have received to meet here and uh, explain the Norwegian Parliament and the control function of the Norwegian Parliament as far as the intelligence and security services are concerned. Control is one of the most important tasks of the Norwegian Parliament. We also uh, have acts of parliaments and uh, the, the state budget. But control means that we check that the government policy takes place on the basis of the acts of parliament. We have 12 parliament committees in uh, the Norwegian parliament and control is very important. It is the control and constitutional committee and that is the most important of the committees. We also have four external organs carrying out control on behalf of parliament and the most important of these is the Norwegian Court of Auditors. And furthermore, we have an ombudsman for the civil administration and we also have an ombudsman for the defence. The fourth organ is the so-called EOS committee after the Norwegian acronym and that is the subject of my presentation. This particular committee controls the intelligence, surveillance and security services 
hence the Norwegian acronym EOS, the EOS Committee. This particular committee was established in 1996, and the legal basis for that committee is a special act of parliament that is passed by the Norwegian parliament. The background for the establishing of this particular committee was a very wide ranging public debate concerning the activities of the secret services in Norwegian. There was a lot of criticism, which meant that the, uh, the parliament in 1994 established a commission to look to have a look at the services, the secret services. The report from this commission after two years of work concluded that the police surveillance service, especially in the 1960s and 1970s, had carried out very substantial and illegal political surveillance. This surveillance was directed at people and organizations on the Norwegian left wing. One of the results of this uh, parliamentary debate was the establishing of the EOS committee. For the very first time in Norway, parliamentary control was introduced as far as the secret services were concerned. That is really the border line between the, the, the bad old days and the new parliamentary uh, control. The EOS committee is a permanent committee of parliament. The members are selected by parliament for a period of five years. There are seven members and uh, we endeavor to uh, have about half of the members as politicians. Often they are also former members of parliament. The other half of the committee we find in uh, the Norwegian society former judges, uh, researchers and what not. There's also a secretariat, mainly staffed by lawyers and the members have maximum security clearance and uh, they are subject to strict rules of, of confidentiality. The main purpose of this particular committee is to safeguard the citizens, is to protect the citizens. It's a protection of the citizens against the uh, surveillance services. We want to protect people's rights against the surveillance services so that the same services do not hurt the political life in Norway. Over and above that objective, we, we monitor the uh, adherence to uh, the law. It's a general control. It's not uh, limited to certain services. The, the criterion is that if a state service deals with uh, surveillance or security, it is subject to parliamentary control. Most of the control deals with the traditional secret services like the police intelligence unit and the military intelligence service. The committee has three ways to control. There are inspections, approximately 30 every year, 30 inspections per year. And secondly, we treat complaints from citizens roughly 20 to 30 every year. And thirdly, the committee can begin its own investigations about 20 every year. The uh, committee has almost limited, unlimited rights of inspection and has access to all archives and registers. They also have access to all buildings and uh, facilities. And the uh, committee can also invite the services and the administration to explain what they are doing subject to uh, the uh, usual rules 
concerning witnesses in court. There are, there's a framework for inspections. We have to inspect the police intelligence service at least six times a year and the military intelligence twice yearly. Over and above that, the regional organizations of these services will also be inspected. As a main rule, we inspections must be announced in advance, but there's also access to surprise inspect there's also a possibility for surprise inspections and that actually happens quite often. If a citizen believes that he or she has been wronged by one of the EOS services, that person can complain to the committee and they will deal with all complaints within their area. There's been uh, roughly 20 complaints every year and uh, the complaints may lead to criticism of the services. But as I said, the committee can also start its own investigations and over the last couple of years, three such own initiative reports have been handed into Parliament. That was firstly the police intelligence service methods. The committee was of the opinion that the legality of the methods should have been evaluated before the so-called treehold case. And uh, the, the, the committee said that the police had the right to listen to phone conversations but not to what happens in rooms, or it happens in people's uh, houses. The second own initiative report was the uh, police registration of two Islamic uh, groups And uh, the committee looked at the uh, treatment of uh, religious and political views in the police registers. And uh, the conclusion was that in certain cases the police intelligence service went too far and uh, registered information that, was of, uh, that were of little relevance to the case in point. The third report had to do with surveillance and registering of Norwegian citizens in the street in front of the American Embassy in Oslo. The police was criticized for not having the correct information as to the security system in the embassy and, they, and lack of communication with the Ministry of Justice. At present, the committee has two cases. One of them is uh, a case with police informants that have infiltrated the extreme left information to that effect came out in a TV news um, emission and uh, the committee looked through the archives of the police and had interviews with the police staff. The second case has to do with the intelligence service. There's a case that uh, the archives are not in accordance with the rules and two unannounced inspections were carried out because of citizens' complaints. The EOS committee has, over the last couple of years, established a cooperation with other control uh, committees such as Sweden, the Netherlands, Canada. All of them have uh, committees that look a lot like the uh, Norwegian EOS committee. There are many ways to control the security services. But regardless of the models you choose, there is a common objective. You work on behalf of the citizens and their legal and human rights which have to be respected by the, the security services. Security services cooperate to fight international terrorism and that also calls for control of the relationship between different security services, Norwegian and other countries, such as uh, electronic uh, information and uh, 
hidden uh, coercive measures. It's a question of finding the right equilibrium between uh, the private lives of the citizens and the need of the state for protection. Everybody agrees that you need security services and there is support among the general population. But the methods they use are very often controversial. Most of the people who are subject to surveillance will not be told that they are. And the objective of this particular committee is to evaluate the, these methods so that uh, individual citizens are not wronged by the services. It's uh, fixed principles that the committee reports to Parliament. The Parliament does not receive reports with, inf with secret information. The dilemma of Parliament is we have to have confidence in this committee since we don't receive the secret information. We'll have to believe what they tell us in the Norwegian Parliament. The EOS committee sends a yearly report to the Norwegian Parliament. It is uh, filed with the Control and Constitutional Committee, that I, of which I am a member, and uh, then that particular committee writes a project of a resolution for Parliament, followed by a plenary debate where the uh, Ministry of Justice, the uh, Minister of Defence participate. So there's ample room to discuss the uh, activities of these different secret services. There's broad consensus in Norway that democratic control with the secret services is of major importance if we want to protect our democracy. The Norwegian model with a control committee selected by parliament has been a success in our view. It's a very demanding objective for this committee and they need actively to take up uh, cases within the framework of the mandate and the control activities of the EOS committee is a very important contribution to confidence in and uh, understanding of the secret service as, is, as befits a, a, a democracy wanting to protect itself against international terrorism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I ask you to switch off the microphone? Okay, thank you very much for the very... Ευχαριστούμε πολύ για την ενδιαφέρουσα παρουσίαση. Θα ξεκινήσουμε με τους σκιώδεις εισηγητές που είναι παρόντες ο κύριος Βόσ εκ μέρους του ΕΛΚ. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Firstly, Mr. Tetchner, thank you very much for your report to us. I have a number. Thank you very much for reporting to us. It's very interesting, and I just have a number of small questions. Firstly, I mentioned that you're talking about a domestic secret service that you mentioned. Is there also a foreign-based secret service or an external service which needs to be protected by uh, perhaps UN units, uh, for example? Is that also covered by this control committee? And uh, moving on to individual cases, how deep or thorough does the information is the information that you obtain generally when it relates to individual cases. Furthermore, since the Breivik case, has anything changed in Norway in the structure or the way that tasks are organized? Furthermore, you said that when you you meet uh, when to respond to complaints that come in from citizens, um, do you also meet on the basis of any perceived threats or do you only convene meetings on the basis of 
complaints that have come in from citizens. And what about non-Norwegian citizens? Can they also address your committee? Thank you. Mr. Tetchner? Yes, I didn't... I, um, yeah, yeah, I've fixed... I only got the German question in German in my earphone, but it doesn't matter. I do understand a little bit of German. But with that reservation, let me answer your question. Firstly, you asked me whether the uh, control also dealt with the foreign intelligence operations in Norway is part of ISAF in Afghanistan, for instance. Yes, it does. As a matter of course. This particular committee has the responsibility for all security services, whether they carry out surveillance of Norwegians in Norway or abroad. But I don't think we control non-Norwegians abroad. There must be some sort of connection to Norway. Secondly, how far can you evaluate the methods? The answer is very far indeed as far as the uh, security services methods. And that goes for all four security services. The uh, members of the committee have maximum security clearance as far as uh, secret information is concerned. But in the report to the parliament, they are deliberately vague as far as the secret information is concerned and um, not names and stuff. And then the Parliament must have confidence in the uh, evaluation and hope that the more vague terms gives Parliament a general idea of what is going on in the secret services. And thirdly, the uh, terrorist attack against uh, civilians uh, by this Norwegian, Mr. Breivik. Let me say about that, that um, in two areas there's been uh, criticism of the police security, the police intelligence service. They were not um, careful enough, they were not uh, zealous enough, and the uh, head of the uh, police intelligence at the time said that it was uh, not possible to catch Mr. Breivik on the police intelligence radar, as she phrased it, and she was criticized for that, because it was no longer possible, it was not possible to have a Stasi-like system the way they had in the German Democratic Republic, and she was much criticized for that explanation. We don't want a surveillance society, obviously, but on the other hand, the police intelligence service, in this particular case, clearly hadn't seen the degree of danger. Mr. Breivik bought material enough to produce a major bomb with the, uh, the results we've seen. I'm talking about his bomb attack against the uh, government buildings in downtown uh, Oslo. That was one part of his, his attack. The second part was the uh, attack against the uh, socialist youth movement camp on the island, where he uh, used three different weapons. And he was in legal possession of all three arms. We've had uh, two reports about the police intelligence service and the events of the sec 22nd of July, and both of them contain criticism of the police intelligence. Because of the lack of 
surveillance of dangerous people. It's also a problem that many mental cases carry out attacks, carry out atrocities without any political aims and hence are not on the radar. And let me add that uh, the whole debate, the whole public debate in Norway has changed. There's much greater acceptance of the fact that the police will have to know what goes on in Norway. They need the resources. There's much more understanding for the police and the necessity of resources to the police for them to follow developments. And don't forget that Norway was a very innocent place, naive if you will. We have a confidence culture in Norway. Only the last couple of years have we felt the need that police must protect our politicians, for instance. Okay, the right language. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, now I switch hats and I will ask a few questions uh, on behalf of the, uh, the Liberal group as the shadow. And then I think uh, the other members present have all asked for the floor. I expect Mr. Sippel also would like to put a question. Yes, okay. Um, okay, but first, uh, my, myself, not as chair, but uh, as a shadow rapporteur on behalf of uh, ALDE. Um, first of all, I, I have three sets of questions, basically. Um, you say the, your system works uh, well. You feel that you have sufficient oversight, and the way you describe it, it sounds uh, indeed very, um, very efficient. Um, but what, what, were, what was your reaction to all the revelations uh, of mass surveillance? Uh, in particular, as you, um, your country is next to another country, Sweden, which apparently is one of the major nodes in, uh, in, in all the, the networks. Um, uh, and apparently this had already been, if I'm not mistaken, spotted by one of the people who uh, who triggered the Echelon um, investigation. So much of this was already known or, or visible to some extent. So were you taken by surprise? Did you, do you have the feeling um, that this is something that uh, you should have been informed about? Um, then secondly, you also mentioned uh, you say you have oversight over national intelligence services, but it's much harder to, to verify what happens as soon as there is cross-border cooperation. Uh, clearly, this is one of the, the key issues, because even if there are oversight mechanisms, which in many cases are extremely weak, um, then you know, as soon as there is cross-border cooperation, that cooperation completely escapes any kind of democratic oversight. So have you developed any thoughts on that? And then finally, I also have a few questions about the Breivik case. Um, I was wondering, you say there is greater acceptance now of, uh, by the public of um, uh, data collection. But I, you know, if, what I read in the, the, the papers is that Breivik was had at some point already appeared on the radar screen of the security services. Mm. Now, this is a pattern that we see in all major attacks, that the, the terrorists or the perpetrators were known beforehand to the security services. So if they had access to that information, if he had already been spotted, then you know, is, is the, then apparently they already had the information and the powers they needed. So why is then the, re the, re the response not, we need to improve the way we process that information, rather than saying, you know, we need more data on probably innocent citizens. Basically, you know, making the haystack bigger, making it even more difficult to, to, to find out um, uh, or, or to, to identify such individuals uh, like lone wolves. And then my final question, um, 
we were always told that the, uh, the so-called TFTP agreement or TFTP data, the agreement that we have with the United States, which is very controversial and um, uh, which this House has, has asked to, for to be suspended, but we were always told um, that that was essential um, in the, the case against Breivik, apparently not in preventing the attacks, but at least in the investigation and the, the prosecution, I, I imagine. Um, and I would like to know if, in your view, there would have been other mechanisms, such as um, uh, the... Um, uh, uh, the mutual legal assistance agreements that exist uh, between the United States and European countries. In your view, could other mechanisms have been used you know, to ask for specific information about this specific case rather than having this bulk uh, transfer of data? Thank you. Yeah, talk uh, for... Um Thank you very much for your questions. To the first response mode. First question. Whether we were surprised about the extent of the mass surveillance. The answer is yes, we were surprised. The Norwegian public opinion and the politicians are no more informed than the average newspaper reader. So when you see that there are secret channels leading from the major IT suppliers to the Norwegian state, secret channels with information about the customers, such as Apple and Google and Facebook, you name it, Microsoft, and that that is not international surveillance, not, not looked upon as such in the United States, because these companies are under the under American jurisdiction, and that these same services will have to hand out information when asked to do so. 40,000 such requests were addressed to Google concerning information about Google customers. And that, I think, is a surprise for politicians as well as public opinion in general. In Norway, we have this special case that, that Sweden has passed a law that makes it legal to, to carry out surveillance of all the data traffic between Norway and Sweden. In the case of Norway, it's nearly all of it. Even the lines of communication between southern Norway and northern Norway go through Sweden, which means that the Swedish Secret Service can capture information, emails, telephone calls between two parts of Norway. And that is obviously a problem for a sovereign state. Sovereignty is not just a question of physical borders and the uh, monitoring of who walks past your border, but also the virtual borders. Only in a sovereign state, only its own administration has the right to carry out surveillance of its own citizens to see whether they carry out something that is of police interest. It's a competence. You have delegated to your own police. You cannot delegate it to another nation, even a friendly nation. And Sweden is a friendly nation. We are partners in many ways, but it is. At the end of the day, no, the Norwegian authorities that look after Norwegians. And we have a new government, a non-socialist uh, government in Norway, and part of their program 
is the uh, the question of the Swedish legislation, the so-called FR Act, the uh, defence radio surveillance law of Sweden. That gives this particular Swedish facility the um, the possibility of listening in on Norwegian communication. When you talk about cross-border cooperation, that is always a problem, but there's one principle we have to adhere to. You cannot just give a foreign intelligence service the right to enter your communication systems and go fishing there. That is the right reserved for the local security services, the local police and under the demo democratic oversight of that country. As far as Mr. Breivik is concerned, the investigation was not much of a problem. He confessed, uh, there were witnesses, uh, there was an exact description of what the man had, had done, so from a from an investigation point of view, there wasn't uh, much of a need for secret services. The question was then whether the police intelligence service ought to have spotted this development before these terrible acts were carried out. It's true that Mr. Bravik had a criminal record but he was uh, convicted of vandalism, tagging on a wall, but not terrorism. He was also without any political attachment. So that was another reason for not appearing on the radar. In many ways, he was a lonely wolf, and uh, they are very often very difficult to spot. They are not part of, of of an environment, so they are very difficult to spot. Echelon, well, that started in 2001, and uh, we have now moved far beyond what was Echelon. And then we have the so-called FRA Act in, in Sweden, which is a major problem for us in Norway as far as protection of human rights are concerned. Thank you. Okay, next speaker on the list. I have four speakers. I'll take them in the following order. Mrs. Morvai, Mrs. Zippel, Mr. Engström and Mr. Enchu. Mrs. Morvai. Thank you, Chair. I would also like to take this opportunity to speak Hungarian, my mother tongue. I would like to thank our Norwegian friend for the very interesting presentation. Question number one. If this tapping uh, case really shocked the public when it became clear that this was much more widespread than one would have thought, and it really has nothing to do with national security anymore, then how come that on behalf of the decision makers there is so little interest? What could be done about this? Out of the 80 members there are only four of us present as members of parliament who uh, care to show any interest in this issue and this is not the first time that this has happened. So to paraphrase the question, maybe Edward Snowden was right and what he was afraid is going to come true, namely that uh, the discovery of the truth uh, is not going to lead to anywhere, even though he risked his life for the truth to be uncovered. My next question. If any member state similar to yours uh, in, which is in charge of control and supervision of the secret uh, services or uh, military and police uh, um, services 
trying to protect the rights of the citizens against uh, any such infringements of rights. What would be your suggestions? How could we make it certain that this doesn't fall prey to the usual uh, government versus opposition fight, but it really does protect uh, the citizens against the abuse of power. My third and last question. The case concerning the protesters in front of the American Embassy in Oslo, which really caught my attention. If I understood you correctly, this was an example of when uh, your the EOS uh, committee had to look into the issue. If I understood you correctly, there were protesters uh, demonstrating in front of the U.S. Embassy in Oslo and people were uh, uh, and, and the Secret Services really followed uh, these people and and some of the, the procedures were simply illegal. How did you come to this conclusion? What were these illegal uh, procedures and what was the was there a public uproar when this was unveiled coming from a former communist country we would have thought that this would never happen in the west in a democratic country but apparently it can and if it does uh, what's uh, the uh, option of this mr tetchner um tak um yeah, this first is Thank you very much. As far as the first question is concerned, why is it that you are surprised and isn't there a major pressure from the public opinion to refuse surveillance? The general opinion feels that something is important. They need to feel personally involved to reach the opinion that it is important to have the surveillance. Very often when you talk about short-circuit television, there are 5,000 cameras in Oslo, in the city of Oslo, in the streets. It started as a very controversial project, but uh, people have reached the conclusion that it uh, street crime is down and uh, many citizens will say, well, I have nothing to hide, which probably explains that there, there's no political dynamism behind the point of view that these cameras must be removed. And I agree with the uh, question that... Uh, it ought to be uncontro uncontroversial from a political point of view. That's why we have a non-political EOS committee. They report to the elected politicians in Parliament, to the Parliamentary Oversight Committee, where we discuss with consensus. It's not so much government against opposition. We all uh, work as elected representatives. Uh, next question was the American surveillance. Of the uh, area around the embassy in Oslo. Uh, that case is not finished. I don't know what the uh, EOS committee will do at the end of the day. We don't know the conclusions. Apparently, the embassy, the American embassy, apparently carried out surveillance of all the streets around the embassy, not just in case of demonstrations against the American embassy. And the official Norwegian authorities were not informed of this surveillance. But uh, that will be settled now, I'm sure. Thank you, Mrs. Zippel. Thank you. Well, I'd like to pose a number of concrete questions. 
Mr. Techner, at the beginning of your introduction, you tried to illustrate why in 1996 the EOS committee was set up. You talked about the threat of the uh, Norwegian far left. That was one of the reasons you gave. Now, this, the act of spying on the left wing in Norway, was that something that the secret services carried out under their own initiative? Or was there some political force calling for that spying activity? Was there a specific initiative taken to try to set that process in motion? And with all of these questions, they have, of course, an impact on today's activity of the Secret Service. Now, is there a specific uh, description of the mission and scope of the Secret Services, what they can do, what they can't do? And if such a mission statement does not exist, on what basis do you carry out your monitoring activities and assess whether or not the Secret Services ha are doing their job properly or going beyond their remit. Since 1996, the complaints lodged by citizens, have they increased in number? Has the scope or reason for those complaints changed in nature? And just to conclude one final question, quite a few months ago, maybe even years ago here in the committee, in the Parliament, we had a, a debate on data protection and storage. And I remember a colleague mentioned a film that many people had seen. It was called Minority Report. I feel that this debate reminds me of that film because I get the feeling that the services do today what we saw in that film. More specifically, they collect as much data as they possibly can from citizens, from institutions, from associations, and using that data, they try to profile a possible projection to see whether a crime will be committed or not. Now, if you can contradict me and say, no, it's only on the basis of a certain suspicion or a very concrete event, then that would assuage my fears. But I would be very interested to hear whether that plays a role in your work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. In 1996, in 1996, what happens was the uh, Cold War logic being continued. It was not so much a question of chasing harmless political groups on the on the left wing. There are all kinds of political, legal political activities on the left wing. But the opinion at the time was that if you have somebody and they spent their lives trying to squeeze Norway out of NATO and that these same persons could probably have other objectives other than their political objective. It was a question of NATO and anti-NATO logic and it was a fact that uh, these were extreme left-wing groups, extreme in relation to the traditional uh, left wing, i.e. the Labour Party, and it was assumed that they were a risk to Norwegian security policy. And then they exaggerated their activity, and that was the conclusion of the so-called Lund Commission report. But let me emphasize in that connection that we do have procedures for surveillance of citizens. If you want to listen in on phone conversations, you want to listen to people in their homes or open letters, you need a court ruling. And what this committee does is to evaluate if the police has gone too far. 
the secret services, the, the security services, need a court order in order to carry out eavesdropping. Complaints then. As I told you, we have about 20 complaints every year. And uh, some of the complaints come from people who have a medical record on the basis of their own personal situation. It's not, there's not an awful lot of substance in their complaints. Let's say that 10 or 15 complaints are what I would call medical, for medical reasons. It's people who claim that they are being eavesdropped and uh, they tend to have the same contents and it's the same number over the years. Also the number of complaints, the total uh, complaints remain pretty much the same year after year. And I agree with you. You can be obsessed with the collection of information and in the end, you know, you lose, you lose, uh, it, it becomes a haystack and it's too big for you to handle. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Engström. Thank you. I'm going to ask a question in Swedish. Now, as you said, the Norwegian uh, authorities weren't able to uh, prevent Breivik from doing his terrible uh, deed. Were there any other cases? You said that one of the reasons this monitoring, monitoring of Norwegian citizens takes place is to find terrorists and try and stop terrorist acts taking place. Are there any cases where you have been able to prevent a case of terrorism? Now, I'm sure that's a question you can ask because Norway is a state ruled by uh, which uh, is governed by the rule of law. Norway doesn't carry out extraordinary renditions or that sort of thing. So if it had indeed been the case that uh, monitoring had led to finding you to someone who was preparing uh, a terrorist act, then they could be taken to court in Norway. So that's my first question. Secondly, Norway and Sweden have a lot of information exchange taking place, both on the military and civil side of things. And as you said, Sweden has a military intelligence law, and that gives it the right to carry out uh, spying on Norwegian citizens as much as they want to, whether there's justified cause or not. So there's a question here again. Has any help from Sweden or the Swedish military intelligence law led to um, any convictions or any terrorist act being prevented? The first to see as in To the first thing you said, one of the reasons why we didn't intercept Breivik's activities was that he had bought different remedies that any man could use or need but what should have tickled our curiosity was the um, quantities in which he had altered and the police intelligence service wasn't ready enough. The main component of the bum had been registered with the intelligence service, but it was normal or natural for someone in his line of business to have ordered that. And also, when you talk about surveillance, no one in Norway could have prevented the attack. Also, not after having cooperated with Sweden. So I can't say that. No. Thank you.
I think maybe you, you, I'm not sure if your second question was fully answered, whether, whether there have been any, whether attacks have been prevented well, and whether there have been I, convictions. I think, uh, uh, Actually, I think it was. Uh, so, so the, the yeah. Norwegian okay. uh, surveillance has resulted in no foil terrorist plots. And uh, as far as Norway is concerned, the Swedish mass surveillance has also resulted in zero uh, foil terrorist plots. So, yeah, th thank you for the answer. Okay, then the last speaker on the list is Mr. Enshu, oh. who's left, apparently. Okay, then, uh, <laughs> then, then that ends the debate uh, for today. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that was most uh, enlightening. Thank you for coming here. Um, colleagues, then we, that brings us to session two, uh, presentation of um, the first working document on U.S. surveillance activities uh, and its possible legal implications on the existing transatlantic agreements and cooperation. Um, one of the co-authors, namely our rapporteur, Mr. Moraes, is not here today. So I'm going to ask the other co-author, uh, our shadow rapporteur, Mr. Voss, to, uh, to introduce the document. And I believe, and I'm looking at the Secretariat, there is no document in the file. Is there? No. So it will just be an oral presentation. Mrs. Morfa, you have a point of order? Yes, I, uh, please consider this a point of order. I, I must ask, why is Mr. Moraes not here as an author? I mean, I think this is really unacceptable what's going on here. Out of 80 people, Mrs. there are four Morf, or five I, I don't here. think we can answer that here. question. I have no insight uh, into the uh, calendar nor the movements uh, of Mr. Mor Moraes. I, I'm sure he has very good reasons for not being here. So I don't think that I can explain, and I think you should ask him that question personally. But Mr. This is Voss not a is personal here. matter. This is a very serious Ms. political Mrs. matter. Mrs. Morvai, I cannot answer why you know anybody isn't present here. So, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Mr. Voss, you have the floor. So, vielen Dank. Thank you very much. This first working document looks at surveillance, particularly data and the possible legal implications on the existing transatlantic agreements and cooperation. Now before the summer break the, we set up the Committee of Inquiry to look into the NSA issue as things came to light. Within that framework we wanted to collect information as to the existing f legal framework and how it would be affected uh, in terms of the transatlantic agreement. And here we're looking just at the legal framework for data transfer between the EU and the United States to try to shed some light on the way that works, uh, to tr look at particularly safe harbor agreement, the TTIP agreement, and the PNR data agreement to see how these would be affected. I'll begin with safe harbor. Now the safe harbor agreement is an, an agreement of economic nature which the United States Department of Commerce and the Federal State Commission for Transport have set up together with the European Commission. The agreement allows personal data to be transferred legally to US companies. The EU Data Protection Directive from 1995 prohibits personal data to be transferred away from member states of the European Union to third countries unless there is a level of data protection which is comparable, comparable with that of the EU in those third countries. Now the, the Safe Harbour Agreement attempts to put in place a comparable level of data protection for that personal data and allows companies thereby to transfer data. The basic clauses of the agreement have to be respected under Safe Harbour and it means that personal data relating to members, uh, citizens of member states have to be protected accordingly. The Safe Harbour Agreement is 
always subject to criticism and has been since the start. We carried out a few hearings on this matter and the criticism has only worsened since the data revelations came to light. So even at the beginning uh, there were uh, criticisms but the basic legal framework was uh, considered to be uh, sensible and the right data uh, the right framework for that data protection now in the event of a breach of the agreement article 3 makes provision for the possibility of the safe harbor agreement being rescinded by one of the parties and in the light of the NSA spying scandal the european authorities carried out an assessment this summer Last week that was communicated to us and I'm very pleased to see that the Commission has produced this, res this assessment together with 13 recommendations to improve the way in which Safe Harbour works. However, personally, I believe that these proposed approaches given to us by the Commission are not a satisfactory solution because I get the feeling and I think we gleaned this from our hearings from several different parties we got the feeling that the safe harbour agreement is no longer safe firstly The possibility of mining data is twofold. Firstly, there's the illegal possibilities that we've seen through the NSA, but there's also the possibility for data mining through the companies themselves that collect and store data. Increasingly, intensively, companies are using and mining the data for different purposes. If we look to the longer term, in order to protect the data of our citizens in a more effective way, I think we should suspend the safe harbour agreement and to set a new agreement up on a new basis. Because this has not just political consequences but also economic consequences and for our economic partners in the USA. In the short term, I believe that if we were to suspend the agreement or recall the agreement there would be quite a considerable impact the companies that are involved in the safe harbor agreement would be significantly affected but i do think that in the long term we have to make sure that an appropriate level of data protection is afforded to our citizens uh, they have to be better protected their data has to be uh, used in a more serious way and i think we have to find new solutions to this problem because the safe harbor agreement is not a long-term approach it's also important to restore the trust that's been lost between the transatlantic partners now the second agreement that I'd like to address is the so-called TFTP agreement. This is particularly important in terms of relations between the EU and the US. This is an agreement on the payments and transactions uh, data from one country to another and the purpose of it is to fight against terrorism or large-scale crime and perhaps just to add to uh, what our previous speaker said this may have helped in the Breivik case now the European Parliament has already expressed through resolution its uh, strong conviction that p correct security measures need to be in place to try to ensure the protection of data properly. Also, at the same time, we have to ensure security while maintaining the highest level of respect for people's private sphere. Uh, that's something that the Parliament has already agreed to. We believed that what we needed with this transaction data was to deal with the question of terrorism properly, but also, at the same time, 
to ensure data protection levels on a comparable setting. Now, suspending this agreement in accordance with Article 21 would be possible. I would refer you to the EPP, EP resolution from the 23rd of October and the uh, communication from the Commission that deals with the matter considerably. After the agreement is suspended after art in accordance with Article 21, certain measures would have to be taken as a follow-up. Now, Commissioner Malmström uh, talked to the members of the committee in Libe and told the members of the Libe committee all about her exchanges with the American authorities. Now, they said that there is no justification for a suspension of the agreement in accordance with Article 21 following her discussions with the American authorities. We had a hearing with Europol and with the SWIFT company themselves and we learnt that there were no indicators suggesting that the agreement should be suspended. However, if we look at the the implica implications of the terrorist attack on the 9-11 uh, and the financial flows that were involved in the run-up to that terrorist activity, then it's quite clear that this is an important area. The Commission will have to come forward with a proposal for a legal and technical uh, uh, document that would ensure the protection of data in this field. Now, personally, I think that the TFTP program is shaped in such a way that we have to make sure we've got a balance of security and privacy and we need to make sure that we're on a par with the United States as to where they want to strike that balance. At the moment uh, the agreement doesn't target that particular goal. On the one hand we've got the question of protecting our citizens, the security of our citizens, but on the other hand we have to clarify generally speaking, how we want to enter into agreements with the United States, given that the situation is not as we would like it to be uh, in terms of security. So how do we get this balance between the different wishes and desires of the contractual parties? I'm not sure whether just suspending the agreement because it's not perfect for us at the moment is a good approach because I think this would be a, more of an impact on our own citizens than the safe harbour agreement would be. Uh, next agreement is the passenger name record data between the EU and the USA. Transfer of passenger data, this is data that is put together by the airline companies and transferred across. When the passenger books a flight, this is recorded on the airline's software and it's saved there. The agreement says that in accordance with Article 24, if there's a breach of the agreement, then the agreement can be rescinded. And then in Article 25, uh, there is also a, a suspension clause but there's no indication of what should happen in the event of misuse of data by the security services. There was a joint evaluation report issued by the Commission last week in which it quite clearly indicates that in 23 PNR data cases, so these are 23 cases where the NSA have asked for data from the N uh, PNR lists and they've used that to fight against terrorism and this is by the way my legal assessment but those do they are in alignment with what the agreement was set out to achieve so I think this is important to continue to use this agreement to look at EU PNR agreements and to perhaps look into this further to work perhaps on 
having an agreement of this kind to avoid having 28 separate PNR agreements, which would be uh, fragmented. Now, if we look at the way in which personal data are dealt within the USA in terms of how that data is protected, well, that's clearly very differently protected in the US uh, to the EU. They have a horizontally a horizontal perspective on how to protect that data. They look at consumer protection from a very different angle. In the EU, we try to ensure consumer protection through legal standards and uh, legal provisions, and the security aspect is given more priority from the USA side of things. In terms of the spying scandal itself, this obviously has implications on the private sphere of EU citizens and it weighs heavily on the transatlantic relationships. The idea of uh, suspending uh, new or existing agreements such as the safe ha harbour is in my view possible but we have to be prudent. I think if we suspend safe harbour that may boost credibility from our side. It would also help us make one step towards restoring that trust and confidence that we need to. And finally, the so-called umbrella agreement needs to be concluded as soon as possible. This is an issue that Philip Albrecht has taken up. I believe that this is an important contribution that we can bring to the table in terms of the exchange of pol police and judicial information. It could also high, uh, increase the protection level of personal data and it will give EU authorities the possibility to get redress where there is misuse of personal data on, by the US. Thank you. Okay, I have three requests for the floor so far. Mrs. Zippel, Mrs. Morphy, Mr. Engstrom. Anybody else wants to come in? No, nope. then I close the list and I'll add myself as last speaker as a shadow for Alder. Mrs. Zippel. Thank you. Well, let me respect the same order as Mr. Foss in his presentation of the report and ask a very brief question on the safe harbour agreement. The recommendation is to renegotiate the agreement and dissolve the old one. So perhaps we could make it clear why should we negotiate it again anew. Now in the future we hope we will uh, round off and complete our data protection package and if that is the case, well for what cases would we need this? I think it's uh, worthwhile thinking about that before we consider the legal consequences. Now the legal consequences from the NSA affair should not be separated from the political consequences as far as I'm concerned. And uh, when I hear people saying that uh, announcing a withdraw withdrawal from the TFTP uh, agreement shouldn't be seen as uh, some sort of a revenge for the US uh, behavior, well that makes me uh, somewhat irritated. I think it was a European Parliament decision to call for that agreement to uh, be suspended. Now uh, comparing that with some kind of act of revenge I think is uh, somewhat doubtful given th that there's been a debate about the value of that particular agreement for some time and I don't think we should be pushed into a corner here in the Parliament because after all, the decisions we take here in Parliament should be taken seriously. Now the idea of following the money and that being a good idea in principle, I don't think anybody would question that principle. Nevertheless, I would just say at this juncture that since the agreement has existed, many have questioned its preventive nature, whether it actually is a good tool for preventing criminal activity compared with other aspects of the TFTP agreement, which I wouldn't like to mention right now. I think it's certainly interesting to note that the Commission has not presented any compre comprehensive research or report to show whether SWIFT data 
have been collect collected uh, violating the terms of of the agreement. Now, the firm looking after TFTP data has said that they haven't detected any violations on their server. That doesn't necessarily need to mean anything because uh, data could have been transferred from one server to another. And uh, I don't know why it is that Europol and other cybercrime units have not been requested to uh, uh, provide any evidence or any information. Uh, we're just told, no, everything is fine. And uh, it's all very well having trust in other institutions, but I'm not quite sure that is the end of the matter. Uh, now, on the question of PNR data, now Mr. Foss said that uh, we want to avoid a situation where we end up with 28 individual agreements. Now, I don't think that all member states are currently involved in setting up such a system, and if they uh, were, where what budget would they pay that from? Now, last week we heard from Mrs. Malmström that we're not thinking about mining TFTB data in Europe because there's no money available. It's too expensive. And so if we can't do that, if the Commission isn't able to do what we have explicitly given it the task and the mandate to do, well then, where would we end up... Uh, from what budget would we end up funding a PNR system, which I don't think would be a good idea anyway, and uh, one has to ask the question as to the use of this data. You know, it's more than doubtful that it will be used to fight terrorism, this kind of PNR da data. One shouldn't believe everything one reads in the media. There are all kinds of other lucrative ways this, this data might end up being used, and uh, we need to bear that very much in mind and take a great deal of care here and make sure, firstly, we need to see whether the, the agreement has indeed been violated, and secondly, whether the whole agreement really should be therefore questioned. I think both of these points need to be intensively debated. Thank you. Um, Thank you. If I get it right, we are now dealing with a draft report in the Liber Committee without the presence of the rapporteur, and we heard the presentation of the shadow. The title of this v working document is um, USA Surveillance Activities with Respect to EU Data and its Possible Legal Implications on the Existing Transatlantic Agreements and Cooperation. The shadow rapporteur as the actual rapport, uh, rapporteur is away, and so we cannot find out what he thinks. Well, the shadow said the following. On the one hand, he said that on the on information of the European Commission, they don't find it proven that any kind of serious violation has been committed on behalf of the United States with respect to European data. In other w words, in the past, six months or four or three months uh, ever since this committee has been involved in this issue. It has not been confirmed what Snowden and the media and civil organizations um, have said. Do I get it right? And uh, what sort of um, procedure has been going on the way? Has the European Con Commission question Snowden. Why, how come we haven't questioned Snowden, although I have filed a motion uh, to that effect? We would like to clarify this. What is being confirmed? What can we, estab can we establish as facts? And what legal implications are there coming from these legal facts drawn by the European Commission and what is their proposal? If I read it well, nothing has been said to that effect. Whether we can suspend the uh, effect of the trans transatlantic agreements. But I have the impression that 
we are in a, such a lukewarm situation. Uh, only four or five, four or five of us are present, and consequently, there will be any, there won't be any implications. We are not saying that the United States was spying against the European Union. We're saying that only 1% of the Western world is spying against the rest of the 99% of the world population. And it's not a EU-USA issue. It's rather 1% against 99% uh, issue. Uh, and that's what Western countries are doing, and our countries might be doing the same. And there is no um, resistance, because everybody finds it natural. But, I, but uh, I can only ask the shadow rapporteur if I am right. So these were my questions. How far has this committee has gone, and what will be the contents of this report coming out in January? Before I give the floor to Mr. Engström, for your information, Mrs. Morvai, <laughs> the, uh, the arrangement for, uh, for this committee is that the rapporteur and the shadow rapporteurs will jointly draw up a report. So Mr. Voss is the shadow uh, on this committee on behalf of the EPP, but he's also the co-author of this document. So we're all writing parts of the, the final report. So you have listened not to an introduction by uh, just any shadow, but by the co-author of the document. Um, Mr. Engström. Uh, thank you. Um, well, unfortunately, I haven't read the working document uh, since it's not, not, not uh, actually available. Well, but, you, but you couldn't have read it because it's not available yet, and it will be made available uh, before Thursday's meeting. Exactly, yeah. But <laughs> I'm sure the NSA has read it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately the problem is that they seem, don't seem to be sending me copies of, of everything they find out, which I find highly problematic, but, but that's, the, that's the way the NSA works, I guess. Uh, when the document does become available, I do hope that, that it, it will, will be uh, well, a bit more, more critical than, than, than the Commission, because to be perfectly honest, uh, yes, I understand that Commissioner Malmström has, has been over to the US, she's talked to them, the Americans promised, no, we're not breaking any laws at all, and she came back and, and she says, oh, they say they're not breaking any laws, so everything is fine. To me, the, 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 that comes across as, as uh, the Commissioner being just a tiny bit naive. One could imagine, I think, that, that security services might occasionally lie to foreign powers when, when asked about their activities. So I'm, I'm unimpressed by, by what the Commission has done so far. And I would li like to, uh, again, Coming back to, to, to a very similar point to, to the one I made in my question. Uh, when we ha ha had uh, uh, Congressman Sensenbrenner here the, uh, the other week, he talked about uh, how effective all this mass surveillance by the NSA has been. And as I understood him, uh, there has been zero cases of uh, the NSA or the, the great US surveillance machine in general being able to actually stop a terrorist attack or foil a terrorist attack. Uh, Congressman Sensenbrenner said that there had been one case where, where the mass surveillance data had actually led to, to a conviction in court. But that was not for anything terrorism related or it was not for terrorism charges. It was for, for some economic uh, charges. Uh, so with this background, uh, the TFT appears to, to have resulted in exactly zero uh, terrorist plots foiled worldwide. I mean, we heard uh, there's nothing, nothing in Norway, nothing in Sweden, and, and for, from the congressman we, we, we heard, well, nothing in the US. The same would apply to the PNR. With this background that these programs don't actually seem to provide any security at all, shouldn't we consider uh, at the very least suspending them immediately? Uh, because, I mean, we wouldn't put ourselves in, at any great risk uh, by doing so. That seems apparent to me. Okay, thank you. And then uh, with my, uh, my shadow hat on, um, okay, the following points. So I, won't say, I, I won't say very much about safe harbor because I, uh, I share the views expressed by um, the, the rapporteur and, and Mrs. Sippel and others. 
Uh, with regard to PNR, um, well, you know, as rapporteur, I voted against uh, the agreement, so you know, <laughs> I haven't changed my mind. Quite the opposite. So I think that should be suspended as well, and we should be looking at the other PNR agreements um, as well. Incidentally, I do not think that this report has anything to do with EU PNR, uh, and I actually quite uh, resent the suggestion that there is a need for harmonization between 28 different national systems because, because they don't exist yet. And in those countries where they're being created, like in my own country, without a legal base, the creation of such a system is actually being funded by the European Commission. I find that of an extreme cynicism. So, um, but I don't think that we should be addressing the, uh, the EU PNR issue here. On TFTP, Mr. Voss, I do not think we're calling for a suspension uh, by way of revenge. I think we're calling for a suspension because we feel that the Americans have not kept their side of the bargain, because they've broken the agreement. Um, and because the European Commission is unable or unwilling or a combination of both to properly investigate and provide us with any uh, you know, good justification for not calling for a suspension. Um, my fourth point is, um, why have you focused on these three agreements only? Why haven't you focused on other agreements with the United States outside the area of law enforcement and security? For example, bilateral agreements between the member states and the United States on uh, uh, FATCA, their Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, which is also collecting massive amounts uh, of data, and, and I'm sure there, there are other agreements as well. And why haven't you included agreements with other countries which are engaging in mass surveillance, like Russia, for example? Because there is an agreement between Europol and Russia, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm, uh, if I understand correctly, it hasn't yet entered into force, but is about to, or I don't know. But I, I'm, I'm sure there, there are other, uh, other agreements with other countries other than the U.S. that we might wish uh, to look at. Then I think there are two, my two final points are there are some conclusions that we should draw um, for the future, lessons to be learned. Um, first, I think we should be looking at the role of the European Parliament in the conclusion of international agreements. Uh, and I think there's a very important lesson to be drawn from the TFTP agreement, namely that you know, once we have put our signature uh, on such an agreement, we're out of the game. And I feel, as a, as a member of parliament, that you know, I don't sign blank checks. If we give our consent to an agreement, then our responsibility doesn't end there. We're not a rubber stamping machine. And I think this is, this is something that we need to discuss for future agreements. What is our role? I mean, we've been given powers by the treaty to, uh, to um, uh, approve the conclusion of international agreements. But now that we find that once we've done so, there's nothing more we can do, then, you know, I'm not so eager to sign up to any future international agreements of any kind. Uh, and that needs to be clarified. And there, you know, we've asked, you may remember that I believe it was the US PNR uh, agreement where we asked the Europe <coughs> European Commission to commit publicly to put forward uh, a proposal for the suspension or termination of an international agreement should the European Parliament ask the Commission to do so. Now we have done so, and now we see that the Commission is not the least bit interested in the position of the European Parliament, because, hey, we are only the elected representatives of 500 million citizens. Who are we to ask for such a suspension? So this is something that definitely needs to be, be clarified. And then my final point is, um, you know, if we allow the massive collection of personal data, or if, if we sign up to agreements on mass surveillance and what have you, then the other side of the coin is transparency. Because for me, the essence of democracy is checks and balances. You know, it's not just elections, it's checks and balances. If we give powers to public authorities, then we need to give powers to the citizens as well to defend themselves against mistakes, abuse, arbitrary use of, of powers. Uh, and, and here, you know, our laws 
are falling short of what is needed. We have a transparency regulation, but it turns out that in practice it is, it is you know, useless because every time um, there is any kind of, uh, uh, let's say, impact on the international relations with our friends on the other side of the Atlantic, any document relating to those international relations are almost automatically, they are routinely classified as secret and confidential. So that basically means that the U.S. determine the level of transparency in the European Union. That's unacceptable. But uh, we cannot blame our American friends for that. We have ourselves to blame because we accept it every time. We accept that the the clause for exemptions and exceptions in the transparency regula regulation uh, basically means that the transparency regulation is, is null and void. Now, this is something else that we have to look at carefully because we are currently, colleagues, looking at the revision of the transparency regulation. And I hear that some groups in this House say, you know, the talks have, have, have been stuck for so long we need to bring this to a close before the end of the mandate. Therefore, let's give in to the Council, let's accept lower transparency standards, and let's just you know, get the, the thing done and over with. And I think that is a very, very dangerous proposal, and it's something that needs to be addressed in the context of your text as well. Um, so if there are no other pressing questions, then I give the floor to the Rapporteur to... Um, for concluding remarks. Thank you. Let me just say that what this really is about is looking at the legal consequences of existing transatlantic agreements. And so really that means we're focusing on quite a limited range and some of the comments were much more to do with general conclusions about this whole process which goes over and beyond the scope of this report they were more political comments now that's one thing and furthermore if we're going to talk about uh, Russia, Europol, or agreements or other bilateral ideas, well, that would be a good uh, other bilateral agreements. That would be a good idea, but then perhaps we'd end up having the results of our uh, committee of inquiry in about two years' time. Given that there are 28 member states looking into all of the bilateral agreements, well, there's a very large number. Well, Europol and Rus Russia, uh, that's not a bilateral agreement, says Mrs. Sintfeld. Well, no, but you said that other bilateral agreements uh, perhaps ought to have also been looked at, and I think that would have gone well beyond the scope of this report. Furthermore, we weren't just talking about Russia, also the NSA and uh, various other, and PRISM, for example, as well. So that really wasn't the task of this report. Now, Moving back to the safe harbour agreement, we always need to bear in mind the question of, well, unless, of course, you want this sort of thing across the board, but I think this sort of thing is unav unavoidable, namely that data is going to be leaving our continent one way or another. So how do we want that to occur? Do we have in either directive or the coming regulation where we talk about uh, a transfer of data to third country needing to happen with adequate data protection standards? Now, if we're going to suspend safe harbour, then we're going to have to find some other basis for providing an adequate data protection standard to any data leaving Europe whether it's going to be called safe harbour or whatever, is not the point. What we need is a jointly agreed stan data protection standard for any data that we pass on, which needs to have an appropriate legal basis as well. Now, on the TFTP programme, well, there, and perhaps uh, let me make a more general comment, in fact, first, 
There are two measures uh, which overlap to a certain extent as far as our citizens are concerned. First relates to data being taken, siphoned off uh, from a network or from servers illegally on the one hand and we also have uh, authorities going to large companies which specialize in data analysis and asking them for data. Now in both of these areas now on well on the legal side you just need to find a political solution for that but when it comes to legal in data inquiries we need to make sure that they're on the basis of standards we all agree to. Now if you move to the context of fighting crime or fighting terrorism and uh, you're dealing with data in that context, then you have to ask a question as to how we're going to exchange data with the United States. There's the so-called bank data agreement, SWIFT uh, or TF and TFTP. And if we are convinced that it is important for us to fight organized crime and clamp down on the financial uh, flows supporting terrorism, then we need to be able to do this kind of thing. At the moment, the United States is doing this, and that's why we have a, an agreement with the United States. And at the moment, we don't have any facts apart from just a, a tip-off, if you like, in the Snowden paper, which uh, talks about how you can uh, siphon off data from uh, various data streams. We have not really got any evidence that this has actually taken place. The Europol, SWIFT, the European Commission, the United States government, all of those bodies tell us that this has not taken place. Whether we agree, whether we uh, believe that or not is up to us, but we don't have any facts, any hard evidence on the table which would justify or would it allow us to suspend the TFTP agreement at the moment. And even though there's a decision of the European Parliament, I'm not sure if we want to set up some sort of uh, data exchange agreement with the United States, on what basis do we want to do it then, if not this one? If we say, well, we found an, a good balance between uh, allowing ourselves to exchange data and uh, protect having a certain amount of data protection. If we found some sort of balance, are we just going to throw it away? And if we are going to throw it away, then what new basis are we going to use to find a new balance between data protection and data exchange? We've agreed certain standards and uh, they go quite far. And I'm not sure what alternative uh, you're thinking of, those of you who would wish to suspend the TFTP agreement. I don't think there really is uh, any other way forward if we want to monitor financial flows which could be used uh, for terrorism. M uh, Mrs. Morvai, I think you spoke out in quite general terms. You talked about the conclusions of this paper, but We don't really have conclusions yet in that form. Currently, we're just looking intensively at individual agreements which we have entered into. And so I think what you talked about really relates rather more to the final phase of our report. I, because I just don't think it's worthwhile at the current stage to debate as to whether the law has been broken or these agreements have been violated or not. Now on the subject of SWIFT or TFTP we don't really have any facts on the table. We don't have hard evidence to say that somebody has actually uh, siphoned off SWIFT data. You might suspect that's the case but we don't have any proof at the moment. What else do I have? Well Mrs Engström, Mr Engström rather, the fact that we don't have the working document in written form, well, I do have it in front of me in writing, but uh, right up until the last, last minute we've been working on it, so I do apologise uh, that we haven't managed to uh, get it printed out uh, up to now. The original deadline was the 5th of December, and so we weren't able to actually uh, round it off any more quickly. I do apologise, but I do hope that my oral presentation was clear. 
but uh, perhaps here. Let me say again that we are looking at the legal consequences of these transatlantic agreements and all their suspension. When it comes to the political agreement and then, then the question of the role, what the role of the European Parliament might be in that context or the question of transparency in this context, I think all of that is really stuff for the conclusions. That's what we'll focus on in the conclusions of this report, but not in this particular part of the report. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that basically brings us to the end of this meeting, uh, 15 minutes ahead of time, which is not a bad thing. Uh, and then I can announce uh, that the next hearing of the inquiry will be this Thursday, December 5th at 3 o'clock until 6.30. So thank you all and hope to see you Thursday.